Many years ago, there was a woman who, um, an English school teacher. I mean, she was from England. And uh, she was going to do a mission in South Africa. So she had gone down before she was to leave to scope out a place to live. And she found a place and she got back to, this was years ago, she got back to England and she was like, I don't remember seeing a bathroom. Except she didn't call it a bathroom back then in England. She called it a water closet. She called it the water closet. And so she thought, well, I'd like to know about this. So she, so she wrote the local priest down there in South Africa. And, uh, but she's a proper sort of lady. So she didn't actually want to say the word water closet. So she abbreviated it. And she's, so she wrote him a letter asking him about the WC. The WC, that was her abbreviation. And the priest received this letter wanting to know about the WC. And not being familiar with the term, he thought she meant the wayside chapel. So he wrote her back this letter. Dear Madam, the WC is located three kilometers from the house in the heart of a beautiful grove of trees. It will seat 150 people at one time and is open on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. Some people bring their lunch and they make a day of it. <laughs> and on Sundays there is organ accompaniment. Would you like to play for that? <laughs> the acoustics are very good. The slightest sound can be heard by everyone. <laughs> and it may interest you that my daughter met her husband at the WC. And we are in the process of taking donations to purchase plush seats. We feel this is a long felt need as the present seats have holes in them. Yeah. <laughs> My wife, been rather delicate, hasn't been able to attend regularly. It has been six months since she last went and her, it pains her so not to. <laughs> I will close now with a desire to accom accommodate you in every way possible and will be happy to save you a seat either down front or near the door as you prefer. So, um, we like stories, don't we? And, and, and some people would say the best part of the sermon is the stories, especially if they're funny, especially if they're funny stories. But if we think about it, the whole Bible is a story. And even within that story, Jesus told stories that we call parables. So why did Jesus tell these stories? Well, certainly they're easy to listen to, they're easier to remember, and you can learn a truth while you're enjoying the story. That's, that's certainly all true. But Jesus also says something very interesting. He says he tells these stories and he tells these parables because he doesn't want some people to understand them. Does that make any sense? So what I want you to understand today is that Jesus says his parables are not meant to be understood by everyone. So do you understand that? Well, if you don't understand that, we're going to work through that uh, a little bit today and talk about why Jesus spoke in parables and why he spoke in parables. So here's the first thing I sort of want us to get. It's this. Parables separate those who see from those who don't. Parables separate those who get it from those who don't get it. Jesus was talking to Jews when he gave his, spoke his parables, but not everybody's the same. Some Jews sort of got Jesus, some didn't. You know, I think about my brother and myself. Now, my younger brother and I, we are 13 months apart just over a year apart. And um, we grew up in the same house, and we think very different. I find it fascinating. Uh, some things are similar on other things. He's totally opposite of me. The other thing is he's, he's very good at math, higher order math, calculus math. In fact, he's a professor at Penn State Harrisburg and teaches calculus at Penn State Harrisburg. Me, on the other hand, I had to take calculus twice to figure it out, you know? And I still didn't figure it out. Now, I'm told, I'm told that one of my brother's distinguishing characteristics
characteristics as a professor at Penn State Harrisburg is he likes to tell bad jokes. Now that's different as well, because my jokes are much better <laughs> than my brother, right? Uh, <laughs> Anyways, um, where are we at? Um, people are different. That's where we're at. People are different. And Jesus knew that when he told these stories and these parables, some people were going to get it. And, and, and as Jesus even says, they're going to get the secret. That's what he says. What does he mean by the secret? The secret is this. God has come in Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God has come to this earth in the form of Jesus Christ. Some people get it. Some people don't get it. Some do and some don't. And Jesus is actually seems to be saying that those people who don't get it, he doesn't really want them to get it. And I think this sort of is hard for us to understand. But do you remember... When Jesus sent the disciples out two by two in all the villages and all that kind of thing. And when he sent them out, he said, when you go into the village, give it your welcome, give it your peace. And if they don't return it, in other words, if they're not nice to you, what are they supposed to do? Leave the village and even shake the dust off your sandals. Come on, have nothing to do with them. <clears throat> this is part of what Jesus says. If there are people who aren't even willing to listen have nothing to do with them. In Matthew 7, 6, Jesus says, don't throw your pearls to be trampled upon by swine. That's what he says. That's confusing, but you know what he means? You have this precious gift called the gospel. Don't give it to people who are just going to basically spit it back into your face who don't care at all. Don't give it to them. And this seems to be along that same sort of line. Jesus is talking to all these people. Guess what? To some, he's talking, they get it. To others, he's talking, and they're not going to get it. And if their hearts aren't ready to get it, they're just not going to. Jesus seems to be, that's the way he wants it. Until their hearts are ready. So, Parables separate those who see from those who don't see. The second thing I want to say is this. Parables, to understand parables, we need to see with spiritual eyes. With spiritual eyes. So take a parable in Matthew chapter 13. Not too far from the what we read this morning, verse 45. I'll read you the parable. It's very short. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. Now, for those of us who can see, we realize what Jesus is saying. Not a pearl, but the kingdom of God is so valuable. I, I should be willing to give up everything just to have Jesus. Everything. But you see, if we don't have the spiritual eyes to see that, they were probably going to look at this parable and say, well, that guy's pretty stupid. You're supposed to diversify your portfolio, right? Diversify your, diversify your portfolio. What happens if the bottom drops out of the pro market? What's he left with? They don't get it, right? Because to get it, we sort of have to see it with spiritual eyes. Now, it's perhaps a fair question to ask. Well, why don't Jesus just speak more plainly? And more people will get it. I don't think so. I don't think if our hearts are in tune to God, even if Jesus would come right out and say, you know, to follow God you have to give up everything, they still wouldn't get it. They still wouldn't get it. And yet a story can sit with us. And if somebody is at least their hearts open, maybe they don't fully understand, but their hearts open, that story can sit with them. And maybe one day they will get it. To understand parables, we have to see them with spiritual eyes. And the third point I want to make this morning is this. The parables make us work for truth. 
And it's not a bad thing that we have to work at to get truth. I don't know how many of you have taught, either at school or, or at Sunday school and church, Bible study. But if you taught, one thing you learn very quickly is, I really got to know what I'm teaching. Because it's that first question that comes out of nowhere, and it's like, uh, I, I don't know, which if we don't know, we should say it. But to, so to really teach well, we really have to do a lot of work. But it's worth it because we know what's true. We understand. We understand the truth. So, another parable. The parable of the sower and seed. This is the parable that actually uh, Jesus tells, and then they, and then the disciples ask him, "Why do you speak in parables?" So it comes right before our scripture for today. The parable goes like this. There's a farmer who goes out. He's scattering seeds just everywhere. Willy-nilly, he's just scattering seeds. Some of those seeds lands on packed, like a path, packed soil. If nothing happens to it, it just lays on the top. Some lands on soil, but it, the soil's thin. So it sprouts up, and once the sun starts to hit it, the soil dries out and withers up. Some lands in deeper soil. Except there's a lot of weeds and stuff. So it grows up, and so do all these weeds, and eventually all these weeds choke it out, and it's not very productive. And then some lands in good soil, and it produces 30, 60, 100 fold. It produces an abundance. See, we have a parable like this, and Jesus wants us to wrestle with the parable. What does that mean? And once we figure out that that the seed is the word of God and the soil is our hearts. We begin to ask that question, what, what soil are we? And maybe we might come up, for instance, to say, you know, I, I realize with this parable, I'm the weedy soil. Because Jesus says the weedy soil is, we're too focused on the cares of this world. When they become more important than God, that's the weedy soil. Or maybe we think we're the thin soil. And that's the one that when things get rough, we just sort of wither. You know, when it becomes too hard, we give up. You know. What are we? See, that's what Jesus wants us to ask. It's not just an interesting story. And then what do we need to do to become good soil? We really need to want it. You know, the fascinating thing to me about Jesus is he gives us exactly what we want. Oh, we don't want to do a whole lot of work and we don't want to, okay, you can live that way. God will let you do that. But if we really want all of God and all the blessings he has to give, then we really have to give ourselves. The psalm that we uh, read this morning, the 42nd psalm, that's, it begins and it's so familiar because we have a praise song, you know, that starts with those verses. It goes like this. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. How beautiful that is, that melody. And yet, I think the melody doesn't capture the image of the song at all. Because what it's really saying, as a deer pants for water, the question is, why is the deer panting for water? More than likely, because I've been told deers don't normally pant unless they've been chased by a wolf or something. So the real imagery is this deer's been chased by a wolf and it's outran this wolf finally. And it's just water, you know, desperately. Is that how much we need God? Is that how much we want God? When we want God that bad, we will understand and we'll receive his blessings and his peace and his love and his, and his joy. So let me give you a couple, three questions, okay? 
The first one is this. What soil are you? Don't answer out loud, but just think about that. Maybe something to think about this week. Which of those four soils, packed, thin, weedy, or good soil? Which, which is your heart? Which soil are you? Second question I want to leave with you is this. How desperately do you want God? How desperately do you want God? And then a third question I would add would be this. What needs to change in your life to give you good soil and so you really want to know God? And the church is the place to do that, by the way. We can help you with that. You know, if you if you have this desire to want to grow deeper in God, we can, we can help you with that. Believe me. I'm going to finish with a story, since we're talking about stories. And um, this story talks about the power of God and what God can do with little. Okay? And with a little girl. And the little girl was named Hattie Mae Wyatt. She lived in Philadelphia in the 1880s. And Hattie Mae loved to go to church. And she loved to go to Sunday school. But this church had a problem that I would love to have, and in which I haven't seen any church have in a long time, but the problem is this. They had so many kids for Sunday school, they didn't have room for them. They didn't have a place for all these kids who were coming to Sunday school, and, and little Hattie would talk to the pastor about that, and, and, uh, and, and how she had this desire for a bigger place so more kids could come to Sunday school. Well, Hattie got sick, and without good medicine back then, eventually Hattie died. Hattie's mother went to the pastor and said, you know, Hattie really wanted this new Sunday school, so she saved up money for it, 57 cents, which actually was quite a bit of money for a young girl in 1886, you know. And so she saved up 57 cents and she gave it to the pastor and said, you know, I don't know what you'll do with it, but here. So the pastor got this idea. So he sold the pennies to members of the congregation, told him the story and sold Hattie's pennies. And he got $250 for those pennies. And then the women of the church formed the Wyatt Light Society and they had fundraisers. And before you know it, they were able to buy a house to have a Sunday school in for more and more kids. Now the story gets even more interesting because uh, the pastor, um, his name was Reverend Conwell, I believe. Um, he was tutoring a young man in trying in education, not necessarily theology, but all facets of education. And this man asked some other friends if he could tutor some other friends, and they started to meet as well. And since the house was there, they met in the Sunday school house, right? And as more and more started to meet, it started to grow and grow. And that house was the very first building of Temple University. That's where Temple University started. Is Hattie Mae Wyatt? And 57 cents. Because she wanted God with everything. And she gave God everything. And God did amazing things. When we give ourselves to Him, He will indeed.